Hello and welcome to the fifth in my series of presentations on the conflict between science and creationism. Today I'm moving away from astronomy and down to planet Earth with a presentation on radiometric dating. As ever, I'm basing my talk today on the slide presentations of the infamous young Earth creationist Kent Hovind. This means I'm going to respond to points raised in his slides, so I won't cover all of this topic by any means, just the bits that are relevant to creationist claims. Lots of these arguments are dealt with in the wonderful archive on talkorigins.org. Please search for their extremely detailed site and read their much more thorough rebuttals of these claims. You can find many of the arguments that I've used here on that site. However, I've added a few extra bits here to bring the coverage up to date. So let's get started. Radiometric dating is a wonderfully powerful tool for science. It shows beyond any doubt that many of the rocks on Earth are billions of years old and that many fossils are tens or hundreds of millions of years old. If radiometric dating is reliable, then young Earth creationism is 100% false. If creationists cannot successfully counter this scientific discipline, then their entire argument is dead. So, as you might imagine, creationists waste a lot of energy attempting to show that radiometric dating is not as reliable as scientists claim it to be. There is lots of good information on Wikipedia, as ever, so please check out the articles on that site if you get time. What is radiometric dating? Well, in essence, it's a method of measuring the age of a sample, be it an organic sample like a piece of wood or preserved flesh, or maybe a clay pot or fossil or a rock. Radiometric dating is really a family of methods, all built around the same basic principle, that certain elements are unstable, that is, they decay over time into lighter elements. Often, different isotopes of the same element have vastly different decay characteristics. You may remember from high school science lessons that an isotope is like a different version of the element. The identity of an element is based on the number of positively charged protons in the atom's nucleus. However, there are also neutrons in most atomic nuclei, and the number of these can vary slightly. This variation gives us different types of the same element. An example of this is carbon-14, which is a variety of carbon with six protons as usual, but eight neutrons instead of the usual six in the far more common carbon-12. Carbon-14 decays rapidly over time, well, rapidly in geological timescales, it has a half-life of around 5,730 years. That means that if you keep a sample of carbon-14 for 5,730 years, you would expect half of it to have decayed in this time. After another 5,730 years, you would expect half of the remainder to have decayed, leaving you with just one quarter of the initial sample, and so on. Continuing with the example of carbon, the interesting thing about the two isotopes of carbon, carbon-14 and carbon-12, is that carbon-12 is very stable, meaning that after a few thousands of years you would expect essentially none of it to have decayed. This means that if you start with a sample of a known ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, say 1 to 1, then you leave it for a certain amount of time. You can measure the ratio of these two elements again, and from that you can work out what fraction of the carbon-14 has decayed, and hence, with a bit of maths, how long it has been decaying for, based on its known half-life. So, as an example, let's say we started with equal amounts of carbon-14 and carbon-12. And then, at a later time, we find that there is now only half as much carbon-14 as carbon-12. Then, given that we know that the amount of carbon-12 is constant, we know that half of the carbon-14 is decayed. And hence, we know that the sample is about 5,730 years old. If only 1% has decayed, for example, then we can calculate that the sample is around 83 years old. Of course, this means that you have to know the initial ratio of these two isotopes in the sample, and there are means of working this out. But in a very general sense, this is how radiometric dating works. Of course, the modern technique is very much more advanced than this, but creationists almost always dwell on a very simple caricature of this most simple explanation to develop their arguments. They never seem to bother looking up how this technique is actually used today in practice. And you'll see that this is essentially the failing behind all of their arguments. Radiometric dating methods have been hugely improved over the last century since their invention, and the modern techniques can control for, or in many cases totally avoid, all of the complaints that creationists have about the massively oversimplified caricatures that they claim to represent the cutting edge of modern scientific technique. The official presentations given by members of the creationist group Answers in Genesis often state that radiometric dating relies on several flawed assumptions. In reality, this simply isn't true. The reason why the creationists believe this is often because they have this idea that radiometric dating is still being performed in the same way that it's taught in high school, basically what I described on the previous slide. Whereas in practice, scientists today use a process called isochron dating, which makes none of the assumptions that creationists complain about. I'll cover that on the next few slides. But what are these assumptions anyway? 
Assumption 1, the original quantity of the various isotopes, needs to be known. This is just false. Isochron dating, as we'll see, does not require this assumption. It allows you to derive the original ratios of the various isotopes from the results you get. Even with the simple version of radiometric dating given on the last slide, you can get round this problem if you actually measure a third quantity, the amount of the decay product or daughter isotope left. With this information, you can then get a better idea of the actual initial ratio of the two parent isotopes, because you know how much of the parent radioactive isotope decays into how much of the daughter isotope, so you can add together the remaining parent isotope and the amount that must have decayed to produce the observed amount of the daughter. Of course, you're assuming that you know that there was none of the daughter isotope in the sample initially, or that you know how much there was. This is usually a fair assumption, but not always. The second assumption is that the decay rate doesn't change. I guess this is the big one. Decay rates are built on some of the most fundamental laws of physics. It will be impossible for them to change. We know all the various ranges of temperature and pressure to which most samples are submitted, and we have tested decay rates under these extremes in addition to changing magnetic fields and the presence of other chemicals. They always remain constant. We can even test decay rates over time using light emitted from distant supernovae. If you recall from earlier presentations, we can measure supernovae over very large astronomical distances and hence back a long way in time into the past. We don't detect any change in decay rates whatsoever using this method. Now having said all this, there have been a few studies suggesting the possibility, but not the certainty, that some particularly unusual conditions that can be simulated in special laboratory equipment could alter decay rates very slightly, but no more than half a percent at most in most cases. To take a toy example, if we have an isotope with a half-life of a billion years, say, and we measure the Earth to be 4.5 billion years old, then in order for our measurements to be so incorrect that the Earth is actually only 6,000 years old, the half-life would have to be not 1 billion years, but actually 1,300 years, or wrong by a factor of 750,000 times, or 75 million percent. There is also the case of rhenium-187, whose decay rate can be altered by fully ionising the sample, in which case the rate changes by a huge amount. This process doesn't really occur naturally in rock samples, and besides, the elements used for radiometric dating don't suffer this effect. And the implications of such a rapid decay rate would actually be very important. The physics of radiometric decay are so fundamental that any change to the decay rate also affects the heat generated by the nuclear reactions within the Earth. If you speed up the decay rates by such a huge factor, then you also increase the heat output from nuclear reactions. And if you change the rate by such a huge amount, then you end up with a situation that so much heat would be generated deep within the Earth that the entire planet would melt away. But there's more. In order for several different radiometric methods, which is actually what we have, to give the same age, then they would all have to be massively wrong by almost exactly the same enormous factor. It's just inconceivable that this could be the case, especially as the only changes that could affect half-lives would not be expected to affect all elements in the same way. Finally, the third assumption is that there's no contamination. Again, we can easily test for contamination. Isochron dating gives us a very good method for testing for contamination in our final sample. All our results should lie on a straight line on a graph comparing concentrations of the parent, daughter and secondary daughter isotopes. This will be explained on the next slide. If the points don't lie on a straight line, then we know that there's contamination in the sample. Most processes that could affect the sample during its lifetime will only give it a younger apparent age than the true value therefore making the problem worse for young Earth creationists. So what is this mysterious process of isochron dating and how does it work? The process of isochron dating works in a similar way to the original description of radiometric dating that I gave earlier. If you remember, we measure the amount of the two isotopes of the original substance, a radioactive and a stable isotope. We also measure the so-called daughter isotope, that is the results of the decay of the radioactive parent. The main difference with isochron dating is that here we also measure one extra thing, the amount of some sister isotope, that is, some isotope of the decay product. For example, carbon-14 decays to nitrogen-14, so as a sister we could use nitrogen-15, which is also stable and not radioactive. So what does this extra information give us? Well, really rather a lot. The beauty of the isochron technique is that not only does it allow us to discard some of the assumptions that we had to make before, but, more importantly, it gives us a great way of checking whether or not the sample we have will give reliable radiometric dates. It can test for the situations when the dating methods may be wrong, and can allow us to discard the information in that case. Isochron dating requires us to take many measurements of samples from the same test subject. Then we plot a simple graph, on which we display each of our measurements. 
The x-axis is the ratio of the parent isotope to the sister isotope, and the y-axis is the ratio of the daughter to the sister. We would expect all the results from our examination of a single subject, of a single date, to lie on a straight line in this graph. If the points do not lie on a straight line, then that's a very clear indication that we have either a mix of samples from different ages, or else that we have some contamination. And either way, that the dating process is liable to be inaccurate. If the points lie on a straight line, then the more points we have, the less likely this is to have happened merely by chance, and hence we can be very confident that we have an uncontaminated sample, and that therefore our date estimate will be very accurate. What is this mysterious straight line graph that we're using here? Let's look at it in a bit more detail. In this slide, I'll show the isochron dating method in action. This is the graph that I've been talking about. Along the horizontal x-axis, I'm plotting the ratio of the parent isotope, that's the one that decays, to the sister isotope, that is the stable isotope of the same element as the daughter or decay product. This sister isotope is not a product of the decay, and it's stable, so its concentration won't change. On the vertical y-axis, I'm plotting the ratio of the daughter, the decay product, to the sister. In any sample, you'd expect the ratio of daughter and sister isotopes to be the same at formation. This is just basic chemistry. The daughter and sister are chemically identical in almost all respects, as they only differ in the number of neutrons, not protons or electrons, which form the electromagnetic bonds that hold compounds together. So whatever the ratio on the y-axis is, it would have been the same for all of our samples initially. So the values when this rock was formed would have looked something like this. There are some rare processes that could differentiate between daughter and sister, but they're well studied and produce a tiny effect. So what happens as the rock ages? Well, the radioactive parent isotope decays into the daughter isotope, so that means that the ratio of parent to sister goes down. Remember that the amount of the sister isotope doesn't change as it's not radioactive, so it doesn't decay. And it isn't being created in the decay reaction either. That means that the points would move to the left as the parent decays. However, the parent decays into the daughter isotope, so the ratio of daughter to sister is going to increase. That means that the points will move upwards too, and the amount that they'll move in both directions will be related to the amount of the parent isotope. The more there is of the parent, the more will have decayed, and the more the daughter will have been produced. If we put this all together, we see that the points in the graph will move diagonally over time, like this. And that will leave them on a diagonal line, with a gradient that's related to the age of the sample. The older the sample, the steeper this line will be, and that's how we can derive the age. As you can see, if there's been any contamination, say increasing the amount of the daughter isotope, then you will see points shifted vertically on this plot. If the contamination affects both daughter and sister isotopes, then the point will be shifted horizontally. Either way, the points won't lie on a straight line, so you'll know that some contamination has occurred. You can either just throw out the contaminated results and proceed with the remainder, or sometimes it must be concluded that it's impossible to get a reliable age for the sample that you're testing. I plan to do a separate presentation on isochron dating at a later time, but for now I hope this explains the basics of the method.